As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're very privileged to have a special guest today. Tim Warman is the CEO and president of Fiori Gold. He's been in the business for over 25 years of experience in all phases of mineral exploration, from grassroots exploration and feasibility and development. He's on the board of senior leadership roles with some of the most successful exploration and development companies of the past decade, including Continental Gold since 2010, and also Dalradian Resources, developing a major gold project in Northern Ireland from 2012 to 2015, and also at Aurelian Resources, where he supported an exploration team in Ecuador and played a significant role in one of the most impressive development potentials that has been brought forward in some time. He's currently working with Fiori Gold, and he's here to talk with us about some real trends that are happening now in the gold mining industry and how that is going to impact the availability of gold supply in the future. The concept of peak gold is one we're going to delve into at some detail, and then Tim is going to give us a look forward at some of the specific projects that he's got going this year and some of the strategies they're using going forward. Tim, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. No, thank you. It's great to be here. We wanted to focus a little bit on the on the topic of peak gold because that concept has been around for some time, even in other industries like peak oil was discussed for over two decades in the, in the petroleum industry. Uh, peak gold has been a fairly uh, important topic that's been brought up over the past year or two in the precious metals discussions because people have questioned whether or not that's actually a real phenomenon or is that just uh, a temporary uh, thing that will just go away as soon as the price that has been so low for the past five years of gold and silver rebounds, which is there's a lot of people expecting a significant healthy increase in the gold and silver prices in 2018 due to a number of different pressures, not the least of which is uh, Federal Reserve tightening bias, which can lead to increasing interest rates, which can lead to an inflationary environment, uh, which can lead to uh, interest in people rolling out of the stock market uh, and into other uh, equities or uh, assets such as precious metals. Um, but some of the concerns we've had for expressed by people talking about is is peak gold a real phenomenon is that they say, well, as soon as you start to see those increases in up to, from these low, low prices, which are, you know, sometimes below the cost of production for certain uh, producers, that suddenly there'll be all kinds of uh, gold supply available because all those mining operations, which have been mothballed because they aren't profitable, can just be uh, reactivated and suddenly you'll have all kinds of supply. Um, and so the peak gold is, is just... Um, I don't know. It's like something that people argue about, just like they argue about climate change or whatever. So can you give us, uh, from a from your experience in working with uh, geologists and with the actual mining industry insiders, what your understanding is of, is peak gold a real phenomenon? Are we past peak gold production? Uh, or if it is going to be able to increase, uh, what's the kind of a time ramp up that we're talking about? And, and if the if the economic demand and investment demand for precious metals moves quickly over the next one to one and a half years, uh, will the precious metals production be able to respond that quickly, or will we likely end up with the shortages? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, uh, you know, as someone who's been involved in this industry for a long time and who's who's done the gamut from, uh, from exploration right through to production, I can tell you that you know, mines are are not just things that you can turn on and turn off as the uh, as the gold price uh, goes up and down. You know, it, uh, uh, the exploration game alone. I mean, if you look at the the statistics on exploration success um, over the past sort of ten to twenty years, you can see that you know even though exploration uh, spending globally has gone up or has has remained constant, uh, you're seeing fewer and fewer discoveries, and particularly you're seeing fewer and fewer large discoveries, the sort of company-making discoveries, discoveries, the Veladeros, the Red Lakes, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter what the price of gold is. It doesn't change how, how easy it is to find gold deposits. Um, and a lot of the really easy ones uh, have been found already, and so we're having to go to more remote areas. We're having to go to countries that are, you know, less politically stable. 
uh, perhaps less favorably inclined towards mining, and we're having to go deeper uh, to look for uh, for gold uh, below cover. So, so exploration is uh, is one thing that drives the long term supply, and, and it just has not been keeping up. Um, and even just in once you found something, you know, the the timeline to put a mine into production from exploration to pouring first gold is is hovering around ten years because it's just taking longer and longer to. Uh, do the technical studies to, and particularly to get the social license and to get the environmental permits that are required um, to, uh, to to put these things into production, and then just to 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 build the mines. I mean, you know, you're looking at the the you know, simplest case, uh, 18 months to two years uh, to build a mine uh, once you're fully permitted and financed. So, you know, the 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 idea that you can you can just turn a mine on and off is is really, um, I think, something that's put forward by people who never actually had to do it in practice. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I think peak gold is definitely here. And what has the last five years of low gold prices done to the kind of investment that has or hasn't been going on in exploration and development? Yeah, I mean, exploration's just been decimated worldwide. I mean, the, the amount of dollars being spent uh, on exploration has dropped. The majors have really pulled back from exploration. I know one of the, the, uh, the major gold producers here in Canada has actually... Uh, basically cut their entire exploration department. They let go of their uh, senior vice president of exploration and didn't replace him. And, um, and really, they're looking to the juniors and the smaller companies uh, to find and develop these deposits. And then their goal is essentially going to be to try and buy these things once they've been uh, discovered and de-risked. So the peak gold concept is that because of the uh, sharp reduction in exploration and development over the past half a decade, and uh, also just the, the exhaustion of some of the most, um, I guess, easiest to find or easiest to, to operate uh, properties, that even if prices uh, increase and they're expected to, that there's going to be a significant lag where production is, not, is likely not to be able to keep up with demand in the next uh, couple of years. Is that, is that the, the operative theory there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's really a, a supply and demand thing. And as uh, demand can increase quite quickly and supply just can't respond uh, quickly enough. And I, so I think, uh, you know, over the next year or two years or three years, you're going to see that supply remaining relatively flat, uh, but demand increasing, and that's going to drive prices up. People have contrasted the um, flexibility of supply in some other metals, which are often found as byproducts uh, of of a primary purpose for a mine. But is gold one of those, or is gold one that that is often the primary purpose for a mining operation? And so it's not likely that that you know just increasing the production on some other some other um, major um, commodity mining is going to is going to dramatically uh, increase gold production. Yeah, I mean the, the the only mines in the world where you see a, a, a real um, large component of gold as a byproduct tend to be uh, copper mines. Uh, some of these large copper uh, porphyries have. Have a lot of gold associated with them, but but for the most part, you know, gold mining is done as the as the primary commodity. If you could talk to us a little bit about some of the specific reasons why Fiori Gold, uh, the strategies that they're using to find and acquire assets at sharply reduced uh, prices. We we were talking with uh, we interviewed a fellow Lear Gantz uh, last week while we were visiting in Israel, and he mentioned your company. That's why we wanted to get together with you because he mentioned that this particular drawn out um, suppressed pricing environment for gold and silver has created an opportunity uh, for some of these assets, these productive assets, potentially productive assets to be acquired, you know, sharply below their their intrinsic value. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we've uh, we've identified a real niche uh, for growing our gold production. You know, we're looking in uh, stable jurisdictions like the U.S. and particularly in Nevada. We're looking at smaller uh, deposits that are probably too small to be of interest to the majors, so there's not a lot of competition for them. And you know, because we've got a fairly strong uh, capital markets team uh, backed by Frank Justra, a well-known uh, uh, Canadian mining financier who uh, who helped found Fiori Gold, you know, we've been able to uh, pick up assets where uh, others may not. Uh, our particular uh, flagship asset right now, the Pan Mine, um, was a mine that a lot of people thought was a bit of a dog. You know, it had it had been built by a company named uh, Midway Gold back in 2015, and uh, Midway Gold operated it for about four months before promptly going into bankruptcy. Um, and a lot of people thought, well, that was because the asset wasn't a good asset, that that's what had driven them in. But, you know, one of our founders, Ken Brunk, who's our uh, chief operating officer, 
you know, he recognized that that asset was fine. The asset was a good asset. It was really the the team that had put it into production and the structure, the capital structure of the company, that uh, that led to the uh, you know the, the the bankruptcy. And so, he was able to pick up that asset out of bankruptcy for five million dollars U.S. and and you know, that was a project that had probably had two hundred million dollars spent on it over the years during exploration and and the feasibility studies and drilling and construction of the mine, um, and and really you know this was a mine that had had only closed uh, in twenty fifteen, so it was a it was a very new asset in very good condition. And when we picked it up in uh, in late twenty sixteen, and got it back into production and got it operating properly and actually generating cash, I think we've really demonstrated that the asset was good. It was the uh, the structure and the team that had tried to put it into production the first time uh, that was the issue, um, and we've done that. You know, it's a real turnaround story. And and the uh, the way that you were able to get that at such a discount was because there was a, this perception of of low value because it hadn't been able to been operated uh, profitably. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it had really only operated for about four months uh, before going into bankruptcy. And, you know, every mine, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, what company's running it, you'll always run into a few hiccups as you're, uh, as you're starting the operation. But, you know, the previous company had been so uh, overloaded with debt to build that project and, and, uh, and also had some issues with a, with a controlling shareholder who wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, experienced in the mining space. I think it, it just sunk that company when they ran into these problems. And so, you know, we were able to go back in. Uh, the company Fjordgold's debt-free. Uh, we we were able to uh, we were able to, to sort of you know rehabilitate the mine, fix the relatively minor problems that had uh, had caused all the problems in the first place, and get it up and running. And I think you know the the team that we put together. Um, our intention is that that very very competent technical team, a lot of ex Newmont mining guys, um, you know, and and very very experienced, particularly in Nevada. And we intend to deploy that team now that we've got Pan up and running on some of our other assets and on a consolidation strategy of similar assets in, uh, in Nevada and some of the surrounding areas. You mentioned that this may be a, a, a special opportune time to make acquisitions. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, Fiori Gold right now has one mine. The Pan mine, it's going to produce something like thirty-five to 40,000 ounces of gold in our, in our fiscal year 2018. And if that's... If we were going to be satisfied with that and just continue on as a, as a one mine, relatively small company, I don't think a lot of people would be very interested in us. And, 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 and that's why that's not at all what we intend to do. And there are a number of other projects, as I say, in Nevada and some of the surrounding states that are in a very similar situation. You've got a company with, with, a, with a mine that's running well, but it's a relatively small mine. And again, what needs to happen is a consolidation. You need to start taking three or four or five of those mines and bolting them together because once you get... Uh, above that kind of critical 100,000 ounces per year uh, production mark, then you really get a re-rating in your share price. So, you know, I think um, if you look at uh, companies in, in our current space where we are now, and then you look at companies uh, in that sort of 100 to 160,000 ounce production, uh, uh, you know, per year ounce uh, production space, you see a, a real jump. So that for a sort of three to four times increase in our current production, you're looking at a re-rating in terms of our share price of sort of eight to 12 times. So there's a real step change as you cross that 100,000 ounce per year barrier, and that's where we're going. Yeah, if you could give us kind of the thought of your timeline that that you're targeting for that, uh, you have, uh, you've, you've mentioned where you're at and where you'd like to take it to, but what kind of a timeline, What are, if you can tell us more about your 2018 milestones versus your, your like, you know, five year or whatever your uh, longer term goals are. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our goal is to get to that 150,000 ounce per year uh, production target within five years. And to get there um, over the next year, you know, now that we have the pan mine up and running and it's profitable and it's producing, uh, we want to increase the production there. We think if all goes well, uh, we can get it up to around 50,000 ounces a year. So that would take us a third of the way to our goal. And that's probably as big as pan is ever going to get. As I say, it's not a huge asset, but it's a it's a good mine and it's a profitable one. The next step is going to be some organic growth through uh, developing the adjacent Gold Rock property that's uh, centered around a former producing mine. And one of the real advantages we have with Gold Rock is that, you know, the federal permitting process, which is what takes so long in the United States, it can take five to seven years to, to get the federal permits for a mine. That process has been running um, all the way through the bankruptcy procedures from Midway. In fact, Midway actually started it. Um, and we expect to have the final permits, what's called the record of decision, uh, on that mine in the first quarter of 2018. So we're going to be in the rather unique position of having the full federal permits for a complete mine build 
for a mine that we haven't yet done even a preliminary economic assessment on. So we'll be doing a lot of that technical work, uh, the engineering studies, the metallurgical studies, building up the existing resource at uh, Gold Rock. And the goal is over the next couple of years to get Gold Rock into production. And again, you know, this is a bit of speculation, but we think it can produce based on what we see there, probably in a similar size to pan, so sort of in that 50,000 ounce per year range. So that takes us the next step of the way to 150,000 ounce goal. And then again, uh, the consolidation piece is really the last uh, piece in that puzzle for us to get to that 150,000 ounce mark. And we're talking to another uh, a number of other companies um, who are in a similar position to us, small companies, uh, single mine, very good assets, but uh, but would make much, much more sense uh, bolted together uh, to form a larger company. And I think I think people recognize that the, uh, that the uh, marketing and the capital markets background uh, that we bring to the table really means that Fiori Gold is the, the ideal vehicle for those, uh, those projects to be in. Well, a couple of things you've mentioned really got my attention. One you mentioned just a minute ago was about uh, being debt-free. That's got to be a rare uh, claim to be able to make in any you know, capital-intensive industry like this. Can you talk to us about how you've managed to achieve what you have and still be debt-free? Well, I think really the, the, the key to that was being able to buy the pan mine uh, for $5 million. I mean, you know, as I say, it, it probably had $200 million spent on it. it uh, you know, it, it, and, and to be able to buy an asset like that, and it wasn't an asset that was sitting on, you know, care and maintenance for 15 years and, you know, rusting out in the desert. This thing, in fact, the, the gold plant was still operating all through the bankruptcy as they continued to irrigate the, uh, the leach pads and produce a little bit of gold. But it was enough that... You know, these are these are brand new assets that we picked up at a and and, and, and really the ability to do that was the, the vision of our technical team to look at that asset and say, you know what, this is not a problem asset. This is actually a very good asset. Uh, whereas other people looked at it and said, ah, oh, this is just a dog, we're not gonna make a bid for it. So in the end in the bankruptcy proceedings, we were the only bidder on it. And, uh, and as a result, we were able to pick it up for five million dollars, which you know essentially gave us a a fully operating mine without having to go into debt to build it because the predecessor company had already built it. You mentioned in passing uh, earlier about wanting to develop in stable um, jurisdictions and Nevada being, Nevada has some notoriety and has for some time gotten, been both for silver and for gold. Uh, a lot of people, we've had several on our channel talking about it as a extremely productive region, but what were the reason, reasons that you're focusing on Nevada? Well, it's just such a, you know, I mean, if you look at the United States um, as, a, as a whole, uh, and there's a great editorial actually in, uh, in this week's uh, Northern Miner about the renaissance of the U.S. mining industry, but, but you know, Nevada it produces something like 80% of the U.S. gold, and it has, I think, two of the top five gold mines in the world are in Nevada. It's just an incredibly productive environment. You know, that's really just a, a, a fluke of the, the geology of the state, um, you know, that there are some tremendously large gold. Uh, mines there. All of the major producers, Barrick, Newmont, Kinross, uh, have some of their major mines there. Um, there's a lot of exploration focus going on there. And I think really being in a place that 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 has mining as part of the economy um, and, and has regulators that are familiar with them, has a population that's familiar with mining, just makes it so much easier to work. And there's a workforce there, and there's power and infrastructure. I mean, you know, we can, we can turn off a, a paved highway and drive to our mine in about five minutes. Uh, down our access roads. So, I mean, you know, we're not up in the Andes somewhere in the middle of the jungle. Yeah, the the ability to navigate the paperwork and the procedures and processes and get the approvals that you need and the parts and supplies and workforce and everything makes sense for any industry. And you can find a place where that's already working and just expand on that. Makes a lot of sense. Exactly. And I guess also from a geopolitical risks and that kind of thing, it's got to be a more stable than a lot of places are. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've worked in a lot of places where, you know, you you're basically being accompanied out in the field by uh, by guards with guns, and uh, you know, I think uh, that's fun when you're young, but uh, but I've, I've sort of gotten over that, and, and I like <laughs> to you know drive around in Nevada, uh, where you know you're you're not going to get uh, shot at or or uh, the glamour wore off on that one, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So the other thing that you said earlier that really got my attention was actually something that, that triggered our memory from when we had uh, interviewed Lee Argantz, um, uh, and he had mentioned that Fiori Gold is not alone in its organization. It's part of the Fiori Group, which is behind Hive Blockchain Tech, the most successful stock launch in Canada's history in the past four months. Can you 
give us a little bit of an insight into what that's all about and and what the relationship is there with Fiori Gold? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think you know uh, Frank Juster and his and his colleagues are are really really good at at seeing where particular industries are going and seeing new opportunities and and really seeing on how to to capitalize on that and add value for shareholders. So. You know, I think they they picked up on the the sense that uh, the, the gold space was going to uh, to be picking up, and you know, Frank's been involved with companies like Leia Gold, which is a sort of a, a larger format version of a Fiori Gold. Obviously, he he helped found Fiori Gold, but the the Hive blockchain is a is another interesting one, and it's actually one of our former uh, board uh, members, Harry Pockrin, who's the uh, the CEO of that. And again, I think they really recognize that the you know, I mean, the cryptocurrency stuff has been bubbling in the background for several years now. But I think they really recognized that the the time was right for it to take off, and that there was a lack of of good quality, uh, you know, publicly traded vehicles to to uh, participate in that 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 cryptocurrency uh, you know field. And uh, and and you know, I mean, the, the success speaks for itself. The uh, the success story has been phenomenal at, at Hive. Yeah. They're, they're, they're a smart bunch of guys. Do you have any connection uh, planned between uh, the blockchain and the precious metals? Is it more than coincidental that these are both being um, looked at by the same group? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I personally am focused on the uh, the, the mining and exploration side of the uh, the business. But, you know, certainly I think, I think you know, to me, the, the underlying blockchain technology that, that, that underpins the, the whole cryptocurrency space I think there's we're in such early days with that, and such a, um, you know, the, the the opportunity and the the potential utility of that is wide open right now, and I, I don't see any reason why, um, you know, you can't combine the the two spaces, uh, the gold space and the uh, cryptocurrency space. I'm not a cryptocurrency expert by a long shot, but um, but I'm sure there are a lot of smart guys out there already thinking about this and uh, and thinking of ways to uh, to you know to to leverage the two. Um, spaces and get them working together. Right. One of the concerns that has been expressed by a lot of people over the past uh, decade is that the true scarcity of investable gold or silver is is um, masked by the fact that it that it can be uh, sold in, you know, you people can either uh, buy, you know, paper rehypothecated uh, contracts for futures in, in gold or silver or sell them without owning any real physical underlying gold. And, and there's uh, even some scandal about uh, major uh, investment banks that have, quote unquote, kept kept uh, assets, uh, hard precious metal assets on the books while selling them off or lend, leasing them out or lending them out and still counting it as the accounting of having it on the... So the, that's what some of the hope is, is that blockchain technology will bring uh, true transparency and... Um, Accountability, so that uh, there, you know, basically the day of reckoning will come, and physical precious metals will mean what it's supposed to mean. You either have it or you don't, and um, people hope that that will help protect the price uh, integrity. Yeah, well, you, uh, you know, you always wonder that, don't you? How many times the same ounce of gold has been has been sold to different people in different forms? Um, yeah, it's going to be. I think it's going to look. It's going to be a very interesting. Uh, time over the next uh, few years with the uh, the whole blockchain uh, technology and how it's applied. Well, we have been talking with Tim Warman. He is the CEO and president of Fiori Gold. Tim, if people want to find out more about the prospects of your uh, young and growing company, uh, where, should they, where can they get more information? Yeah, I mean, uh, our website is a good place to start. It's fiorigold.com, F-I-O-R-E is Fiori. Um, you know, we have a Twitter feed, we have an Instagram feed, but but it's all linked to, from the website, and I think um, I think you know we'll we'll be keeping people updated fairly regularly uh, as we uh, as we push towards our goals. Well, Tim, thank you so much for joining us on Reluctant Preppers. We try to our tagline is aware and prepared, and trying to make people as a lot of our people are interested in uh, real money and uh, physical gold and silver are an important part of that for many of them and uh, being able to get an insider's view of what's going on in the industry and the trends is very helpful to us because if we just we absolutely are of one accord that we can't rely on what you're going to hear about on the evening news um, from the you know market analysts and that kind of stuff we really like uh, getting insider views of of what opportunities uh, exist and especially since we're looking into a year where many of our recent guests have been saying it looks like things are setting up for a good 
year in 2018 and, and beyond for precious metals, people are quite interested in knowing how they can participate in that. Um, if they are, even if they're already holding physical uh, precious metals, how they can participate in the benefits of a, of a improving market. So thank you so much for joining us here to give us your expert uh, insider's view of the gold mining industry and specifically the strategic plans that uh, Fury Gold's putting together. Oh, thank you. 